On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 2018 to take a look at Starship performing We Built This City. Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So I'm going to be titling this video as analyzing the worst song of all time, as that's how it has been described as GQ magazine in 2016. So let's get these guys up on screen and we'll see how they get on. I'm just going to jump in here. As always, the link to this video is going to be in the description below so you guys can check it out there without me interrupting it. But first of all, just to put the spotlight on Mickey Thomas that we can see in the screen because he's been on this channel a few times before, but I've looked at performances from quite a while back. I mean, we're talking 40 years now. And in those videos, I mentioned about Mickey's vocal technique and his use of air, the way that he controls his airflow so perfectly. And to see whether a guy has great vocal technique or not, get him to sing the same song in the same key that he did 35 plus years ago and see if he can still do it. And Mickey Thomas is so spot on here. He hasn't lost anything vocally. You'll also notice how when Stephanie Calvert gets into that second verse and provides her vocal, by the time they get to the pre-chorus and the harmonies come in, you'll see that Mickey is taking the higher line of those harmonies and Stephanie stays with that lower line. So he's still got all of the range there, all of the control. Another thing to mention from a performance perspective, the original record had such a high production value to it 
Taking it to the live stage is so difficult, but we get a great version here with four male vocalists and two female vocalists. So it means with those harmonies, we get such a full sound, but also with the crowd choruses, we get that same sound of the record replicated in a live setting. But let's jump into the analysis of this song as objectively as possible to see why it was described as the worst song of all time. First of all, we'd look at the chord progression to see if it is just a couple of chords or three or four chords and it's just repetitive and it doesn't really go anywhere. It isn't progressive in any way. So from that progression perspective, we'll have a quick run through. I know that the song does start with vocals that they're singing the chorus line perfectly in harmony with each other, Mickey's spot on. So you can't even say that from a tuning perspective, it was out or that it was out on the record. It was just spot on the whole time with this performance as well. So starting off on our F, we then shift over to a B flat. I know that you guys can't see the guitar, but it's not gonna be an instructional video. We're just gonna have a run through the progression to show that it's not just a few chords being repeated the whole time. So we've got this F and we've got this B and then we have a little rundown which is leaving your A string open. It is effectively an F over an A chord because our A is our root note, so it's an F over an A. And then once we've done that, there's just a single G note being played by the guitars here. And then we go again, F, and then we're going, which is a little jump up to the C, F, B flat, B flat, C, back to F. And I'm playing the second voicing of that F. The guitars in this performance do play the F again. like that. So this is just the intro. So we've got a few chords and interesting voicings going on with the keys as well, the synth sound that you hear on that original record. You'll also notice how in the verse, the guitar just stays on the F, but we do have other voicings being played on the keys, the synth sound that adds something extra to it by the time we get to the pre-chorus. So getting into the pre-chorus, we've got so many chord changes going on here. The melody over the top vocally is so strong as well. We've got this. into the chorus. So we've got so many chords and changes going on that from a progression perspective, you can't say that this is bad or simplistic. There is so much going on. So looking at the original record from the perspective of technical ability, we've got great vocals, harmonies as well, spot on. Instrumentally, there's nothing on there that you would say was below par from a technical perspective so that when you listen to it, it sounds bad because the player couldn't quite play the notes that were needed or they didn't have the ability to get the instrument that they are playing to sing. So from that perspective, technical ability wise, this track is great on the record and certainly live here. This then brings into focus the lyrical content of this song. And this is what I think really started it all off because Obviously, there were fans of Jefferson Airplane, Jefferson Starship, and then Starship because of various copyrights and trademarks, they had to change the band name because some people were happy using the name, other people weren't happy that other members were going forward using the original name. But anyway, you've got those fans who wouldn't have particularly supported the change in sound, going to more pop rather than the rock sound originally and having a bit more of a harder edge to the band. But that's all taste and opinion. Maintaining that objective point of view, it means now, lyrically, we can start to analyze the song and see whether the lyrics of the song are just weak and that's where it fell down and doesn't really connect with anybody. 
So when we look at the people involved with writing this song, and most notably Bernie Tarpin, who wrote this song lyrically, having the connection, as you all know, with Elton John, that is his writing partner. And he and Elton John did quite well. He writes all of the lyrics for Elton. So analyzing it from that perspective, you can think, well, did Bernie have a real off day when he was writing this song? And I would argue, no, he didn't. He has said himself that when he first wrote the lyrics to this song, the music to it was totally different and it sounded a lot darker than what it turned out to be. So lyrically, we can see that it's almost like a protest song against the industry at the time. And this song being referred to as the worst song of the 80s or the worst song of all time, it all started with a magazine called Blender who did a little poll of the worst songs of the 80s and this won by quite a distance, but it was almost like a contradiction, that poll, because only successful popular hits were allowed to be in this whole poll that they did. There was also Stevie Wonder in there, Paul McCartney, so straight off the bat, you can't really say that a popular successful song, and this got to number one in the USA and Canada, by the way, you can't say that a popular and successful song is then the worst song of all time, or certainly the worst song of the 80s. This brings us to the main point of contention, certainly from the point of view of the editor of Blender magazine, because he cited a very specific lyric in the song as not making sense. It's Marconi plays the mamba. And he said, who is Marconi and what is the Mamba? Surely they mean Mambo and they should have said that, but they said it wrong and kept it in the recording. It doesn't make any sense. So breaking that down, we've got Marconi, who was the inventor of the radio. And the whole relevance of that is at the end of the line. Listen to the radio. It's a direct reference to Marconi. So anyway, you can say plays the mamba. And it depends how deeply you look at this. To me, thinking about a guy like Bernie, who is such a fantastic lyricist, saying that Marconi plays the mamba, he's not saying that, at least this is my opinion, he's not saying that he's playing an instrument. When you play something or you play somebody, it's you can use them, you can play off them. So everybody <laughs> in the industry at some point has probably referred to people in that industry as snakes. So for me, the mamba is a metaphor for the music industry when we're looking at it in the context of this whole song, because that's what the song's about. The way that he plays the industry is, you used to have pirate stations all the time where they would play music that wasn't popular or it wasn't a product of the mainstream industry, the big labels. They were independent artists being played on the radio. So for me at least, my opinion is that that line means Marconi plays the mamba. He's playing the industry against itself by inventing the radio where there is freedom. Anybody could set up a radio station and play it to people and they could tune in without having to go through that whole music industry machine. This brings up another interesting point about this performance in particular, because when they get to that line, they definitely emphasize Mambo, the oval, rather than the Mamba that is on that original record. And you can also argue that saying Marconi, the inventor of the radio, plays the Mambo doesn't make any sense. Mambo is a Cuban style of music. Why would the inventor of the radio be playing that? It doesn't make any sense. It might be the case that because of the scrutiny placed on that particular line, they're now singing Mambo because that makes more sense than the original lyric. But when you take into consideration the whole song, what the song is about and the ability level of the lyricist who wrote the lyrics for this song, for me, it had to be a metaphor. So my hope for the future is that Starship go back to singing Marconi plays the Mamba because for me, it makes so much more sense given the overall composition, the lyrical content. I know that I'm getting deep into the analysis of the lyrical content here, but 
It is because that line was specifically singled out by the editor of Blender magazine where this whole thing started. But let's get back into the performance and then we'll continue afterwards. And there we have it. Top musicianship across the board with this live performance. Technically such an accurate representation of that original record, but performing it live and doing it this well, the harmony spot on the whole time. I think because of my age, I'm in a lucky position to be able to look at this song objectively and not have any of my opinions tainted by somebody saying something or maybe the industry at the time or people moving on from the 80s into the 90s and then saying that everything that came in the 80s was so uncool and rubbish compared to everything in the industry now i think unfortunately with society as a whole sometimes they will listen to a song and then they'll say to the media what do i think about this song do i like it or do i not like it is it cool or is it not cool to like it and let me know and then depending on the answer the media gives that is their opinion so it is something that tends to be the case that you find so many people jumping on the bandwagon of what is cool and don't really know if they like something or not. They have to be told whether they're going to like it before they listen to it. I also like the fact that we have a lot of major chords in this progression and it's an uplifting sound because of that. We don't have minor chords in there which would drag the sound down to a darker place. Given the lyrical content as well, it is somewhat of a contradiction, which is something again musically that I do like about this. As music is an art form, it's impossible to say that one song is the best song and another one is the worst song. 
It's just one song might be more popular than another, but it doesn't mean it's better. You can't rank it out of 10 per song. I understand it from that point of view that this song was so pop rock orientated and mainstream that a lot of people wouldn't have liked it because they were into how the band sounded before they started to make this mainstream pop rock change to the overall sound. And it doesn't mean that as a pop rock song that it's bad. It just means that the opinion of someone who was into that band previously is that they don't like that sound. They want the band to stay as they were in the beginning. I think that fundamentally, if this song was really simplistic or bad as Blender Magazine and GQ Magazine have referred to it as, anybody would be able to play it. Anybody would be able to sing it because it wouldn't take any technical ability to nail it live because it's so simplistic that you don't really need to know how to play an instrument or how to sing because it is so easy to do and therefore it's one of the worst songs because it didn't really take anything to put together. But thank you guys so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think and if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock.